The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode.
How would you rate your current job satisfaction? So that's the question. Now the person can give it any score that they like. Uh, it's highly unlikely you'll get a 1 or a 10, but it, it has happened. But let's say that the person gives you a 6 out of 10. So they're mildly happy, but not wildly happy. And of course your next question then is why? Why did you rate it a 6? So this now opens up a door for a conversation about their job satisfaction. Now they may think 6 is as good as it gets. So it's not so much that you can get it to a 10. That just might not even be in on their register. So they've decided that you know 6 out of 10 is as high as it goes and they're reasonably happy. But of course your next set of questions could be around is First of all, do you believe that you can increase your job satisfaction? And if so, what has to happen? And how might I, as your leader, be able to help you do that? So you see, you're having a conversation which is a fairly um, innocuous sort of conversation around climate. And then we go on to morale and then we go on to communication. So usually that conversation might take a little longer. In conversation two, which occurs in the second month, we're going to start talking about people's strengths and talents. So let's start talking about what people are naturally good at. What's their natural aptitude? And so instead of us going straight for the jugular and talking about negatives, how about we start with what people are actually good at? And by doing that, of course, and if we can magnitude magnify their their strengths and talents, then we're bringing to the business a significant asset. So, um, and, and this creates what we call an upward spiral of positivity because we're now talking about things that people are in, innately talented at. And the very best place to start that conversation is to talk about what people enjoy doing because there's a high correlation between what people enjoy doing and what they're good at. That's what the studies show us. So let's start saying, well, what are you enjoying in your work? And by doing that, we can start honing in on their strengths and talents. Month three, the conversation is opportunities for growth. And you might say, why didn't I call that weaknesses? Well, I think it's more accurate, actually, to reflect it as opportunities for growth. So these are things that perhaps people aren't doing too well that there is a real scope for them to improve their performance. So really this conversation is about improving performance and standards in the work that they do. So again, you would invite that person to talk about some of the areas that they'd like to work on over the forthcoming year and then what you can do to assist them in that regard. So your learning and development conversation in month four, if you think about it, makes a lot of sense because we've in months two and three, we've talked about strengths and we've talked about opportunities. So out of those two conversations, it's highly likely that there will be some learning needs that will have surfaced. And this isn't necessarily about sending people off to AI, you know, off to courses or anything like that. This is simply around, it could be around uh, coaching or it could be around how to explain something a little bit more effectively to somebody. It could be a lot of things, but it may not be a formal training approach that's needed. Of course, it might well be as well. And then in month five, we talk about innovation and continuous improvement in the context of how we can improve the efficiency and the effectiveness of the business. So this is about people bringing their ideas, their thoughts, their concepts to a conversation with you and you and they talking about what they might do 
um, to make that work. So there's a framework, but you don't have to use the five conversations framework. You can use your own framework. But the important point out of all of this, folks, is that you need to be having a regular catch-up, check-in, conversation, dialogue, whatever you want to call it, with each person that reports to you, either fortnightly or monthly. And during that time, this is not a time to be starting to talk about a specific project. So it's not a case of being able to conveniently say, oh, by the way, while you're here, how's your project going? No, it's much, this is not about that. So you reserve that for another conversation. Now, the interesting thing about this is that what I, this is a concept that I'd like to just share with you. And you'll, I mean, both of these are the same on the left and the right, so there's no difference. Um, but let me share with you what we call the initiative paradox, which is um, a book that I'm going to be writing very soon. And the initiative paradox works like this, that we as leaders want people to show initiative. All right, so we are actually wanting that to happen. The interesting thing is that the people we lead also feel and want to show their initiative. All right, nobody likes to be micromanaged. So what happens is that people themselves want to be feeling as if they're, um, they're showing initiative too. So the irony is we're both on the same page to start with. So as it says, as it says there on those two slides, um, Leaders want initiative from employees, and employees want to display initiative. That's how it is in its purest form. So then we move to the second part of the cycle. And as leaders, we invite initiative. So what we're doing is we're asking employees to come forward with their ideas and suggestions of making the organization more efficient and effective. And what happens is nothing. And the reason nothing happens is that the employees in their head say, think to themselves, there's no point in me coming forward with an idea. My boss isn't really all that interested, really. This is the first time in a blue moon that they've asked me for their thoughts and ideas. So uh, they're just they've just obviously been to... Tim Baker's Lunch and Learn series and learn about the initiative paradox and they're not really interested. So I'm not going to bother putting my neck on the line. All right, now that's where this is a critical stage of the paradox because then the leader thinks to themselves, there you go, this doesn't work. My team refuse to show any enterprise or initiative whatsoever. So the manager's disappointed, of course, with that response. So what he, and he or she does is the, he or she then fills the void. And what I mean by that is that they go ahead and implement their own initiatives and their own ideas and their own ways of doing things because nothing's happening. If there's a vacuum there, it needs to be filled, is the old cliche. So the leader goes in and fills the vacuum, and because they go in and fill the vacuum, guess what? The employees feel validated because they're sitting there and think that there's scepticism about whether the managers really wanted to show any initiative uh, has come home from to fruition. So in other words, they think that they're right all along, and so therefore the manager gets in and does their work for them. So all that does is create a perpetual cycle of a lack of initiative on behalf of the employee, if you can see how that works. Okay. <clears throat> so um, there's five more conversations you might like to think about in relation to that. You've got the coaching conversation. You've got a mentoring conversation. You've got a delegation conversation. You've got a visioning conversation and an encouraging conversation. So these can be another framework that you could use during these months, 
that we've talked about. I just mentioned the last two because a visioning conversation is the why of work, what Simon Sinek talks about as the why of work. So this is around explaining to people that what the, the big picture is. Why are you asking someone to sweep the floor? What's the end game here? All right, can you articulate to them what the what the, the big picture is in terms of the menial task that they're doing and how it might fit in with the strategic direction of the business? You need to be able to not only know that, but be able to communicate that. And that's what a visioning conversation is all about. And the final one is an encouraging conversation. Just because you got to the top um, the hard way doesn't necessarily mean that everyone's wired the same as you. Giving encouragement, praise and support to the people that you lead is an, in, is an important quality of what you do. So I strongly recommend you do that and you do that in a way that's uh, very humane and you might be pleasantly surprised at what you get back. I'm sure you will be. All right, so that brings us to the end of the presentation. Um, I'm just checking to see if there's any questions. It looks like there isn't. Um, what I'd like to do now is just recap. We talked about a performance management framework, and I shared with you that framework at the beginning of the hour. We, I did talk about what was wrong with the job descriptions, and the fact is that it doesn't really include the non-job performance dimension that I mentioned earlier. And of course, when you're designing your own uh, performance management system strategically, you need to take into consideration that non-job dimension of performance. And then of course, we finished up talking about a couple of models around performance development conversations. And my point there is that it's important for you to find the time and the space to be sitting down with the people that you lead so that you can help them with that um, in, in terms of their own development and performance. So I've got homework for you and at the end of each of these eight, uh, six units you will get some homework but of course it's very practical homework, you're not expected of course to write an essay or something. But your homework between now and the next fortnight is to commit to a schedule of regular developmental conversations with your direct reports. So if there was one thing that you could do out of today that was going to make the biggest possible difference in terms of performance, here it is. And of course if you're doing it, I just put a little bit more rigour and structure around that. But really I'd like you to commit to a schedule I want, you, I want you to put it in your calendar. I want the people on the receiving end of the conversation to have these in their calendar. And I would expect by the, by the time we meet again that you would have had your first and maybe only conversation around the people dimension side of things. And of course, if you've got that in place now, then I just simply say beef it up a bit and inject some of the ideas that we've learned today in the Lunch and Learn series. So folks, that's pretty much it from me. Um, the last thing I want to say is that next time we meet, we'll be looking at the enhancing your personal um, influence at the executive level. I know that there's some of you that have completed this in the management version of the Lunch and Learn series, and if that's the case, you won't need to do it again. It'll be debriefed for you, but with a slightly different emphasis around executive management rather than operational management. So thank you for the opportunity of working with you and uh, I wish you the very best for the weekend and I wish you well putting this all together. Uh, thank you very much and goodbye.